All right. Hello, everyone, and happy Leap Day. Uh, thank you all for coming to our Echo session today. My name is Jahadri Castillo, and I'm in my last semester of my entry-level doctoral program, and I'm researching the effectiveness of this virtual program to increase your confidence and knowledge on various topics. Today, there will be a 30-minute presentation and a real case study for discussion. You will learn from one another and will have your knowledge re-examined through a local lens. Through shared support, guidance, and feedback, this will lead to a collective understanding of how to implement the best occupational therapy practices across diverse settings. This program is free and available due to your participation in this research study. Therefore, it is highly encouraged that you complete any survey links you receive before and after the session. You will not receive a certificate of attendance unless you complete the pre and post surveys sent to your email. If you are not receiving those email links, uh, please let me know in the chat and I will make sure you receive them. If you have any other questions, you can also email me. And I would now like to introduce Dr. Kate Barlow, the, for the founder of OT Echo. Hi everyone, thank you for having me today. I'm really excited to talk to you about positioning for play. So just, oops, a little bit about me. I have two children, Bryce and Jake, and um, I'm a sister and a mom, and I absolutely love to travel. And I, when I went back to school to get my doctorate, I did my research in Ghana, and that was in 2014, I was in Ghana. And then when I went to the WFOT conference in South Africa in 2018, I ran into some OTs that I had met and they were like, hey, we're the first to practice in our country and, and we really need some help. Will you mentor us? And I was like, sure. And then I was also a member of the WFOT task force for the University of Guyana. And I was mentoring in pediatrics for those OTs who were the first to practice in their country. And so that's how the mentorship program began is, um, because I was mentoring OTs in two different continents um, who were both the first OTs to practice in their country. And so we started this program in 2019. I had some help um, with David Thumford and Janet Oakland, and uh, we have been going ever since. And so um, Sarah McKinnon, who's on here today is a uh, vice chair of the program and helps me um, get everything, get all our speakers and our certificates to out, out to everyone every month. And right now, um, also Kelsey Sullivan is a research assistant helping on the program. So it's a team effort to bring you free education every month. And I just want to say thank you to all my helpers and Jahydra, who is running this pediatric clinical competency. Um, it takes a village and we and we really appreciate it. And just this year, we started to have facilitators. So like Andanas is a facilitator for OT Echo, and we really appreciate all the help um, to, to get this program off the ground. All right, so for today, what we're going to be talking about is really thinking about um, when you're working with children, are you... Are you leading a therapist-led intervention or are you more leading a child-led, right? Is the child directing the play that's happening? And while you're playing with that child, I really want you to think about what positionings that you're using, because I always look at it as, you know, um, it's a, an opportunity to work on play, but also work on strengthening for position. I tell my students when they do their treatment planning that every treatment plan has to be fun and also has to have a position so that they think about that when they're in their planning. Um, so really when we talk about play, um, play is the primary occupation of children, right? And when we're working with children, are, are there goals to play or are we using play as a modality in order to reach other goals? And I think what's happening a lot of the time is we're not having play be a goal just to have just for the child to play. And so what I really want you to think and reflect about is when I'm working with these children, do they have that play skill? And should that be in a goal in and of itself? Because play is so important for children. Um, 
And when we use play as a tool or a means, a modality to, to reach other goals, we call that a play-based approach, right? So the, that's therapist-led. We are providing activities and we're having the child play. Maybe we're working on fine motor and it's a game, right? We're always using play, but that's really therapist-led where we have something in mind that we want them to work on. And so we are really um, honing in on those specific skills through play. But we have this play to work continuum, right? Where if we have play over here and that's child led, and then we have therapist led over here, this is work, right? And so here's that big continuum. And what we really want to do is make sure that we're aware of that and really reflecting and trying to have as much child led play as we can and really try to make sure we're including play as a goal in and of itself, right? Because um, we want that skill, that social skill, that life skill. If we think about play, um, we learn so many adult skills through play. And so we really want to just take a minute and think about our own sessions when we're with kids and how much is child-led versus therapist-led. So I love this quote quote by Anita Bundy, um, without playfulness, all activities become work, right? Um, and so I'm not sure if you all are aware, but Anita Bundy is the winner. The uh, She was awarded the Slega Lecture for the American Occupational Therapy Association Conference next month in March. And this is really in the United States. This is the biggest honor. It's the most prestigious award that you can get for all of occupational therapy. And I'm so excited that our field is really not only recognizing Anita's work, but really I feel like this is recognizing the importance of play. I feel as though outside Side of the U.S., um, play has remained, you know, it's like in the U.K. and other countries, play has really remained important and a focus um, for a lot of pediatric clinicians. And I feel as though in the U.S., we we sort of uh, haven't had play be as such a strong focus in the last couple of decades. So I'm really excited to see um, that hopefully play is is coming back to the to the forefront of of our studies. All right, when we're thinking about child-directed play, we, we want to really think about these three elements that are involved, right? So we have this internal control. The child is in charge of the play, who they're playing with, how they're playing, when they're playing, when the play stops, right? It's the, the child is in charge. And then we also have this intrinsic motivation element where the child wants to play just for the play sake, right? Like playing just to play. And... Um, the important part of that is like, when we think of older children, we think about all these rules. Like I remember this game Zingo, my kids loved um, when they got to a certain age, right? So they love to play games all of a sudden and that's still play, it's play with rules. But part of what makes play so great is when you don't know who's gonna win, right? And and that's play for play sake. And if we think of adults, I think my husband goes golfing and, and he's not the best golfer compared to some of his friends, right? So they give him like a hand, like the good golfers have these handicaps. So it, it evens the score. So like you have really good golfers and then you have golfers like my husband. And so they they sort of even it out when they get out there so that they don't know who's gonna win, right? It's, it makes it so much more enjoyable when you don't know who to win and that it really shows that even as adults we have this play for play sake right um and so that's that's really the more when you don't know who's going to win or what's going to happen that really adds to that intrinsic motivation of play so don't always let your kids win when you're playing with them in therapy right like you don't want to always know who's going to win because then it will get boring if the therapist always lets the child win right I never let my kids win, but anyways. And then the third element is that suspension of reality, right? Where you can totally go into this pretend play mode. And you know, you can be anywhere, you can be anything. We used to, oh my goodness, we used to play cops and robbers for hours when we were kids growing up, right? It's such a suspension from reality. And these three elements and how great these elements are present is really determining the level of playfulness. And so just really think about that when you are doing your treatment sessions, how much is the child motivated in these activities? 
And, and that's a whole nother lecture about, you know, we really learn through that uh, neuroplasticity when children are motivated and engaged, that's when the magic happens. Um, so really think about all of that because it's all connected and it's important. So our job as therapists is really to create this environment where the, where the child is directing the play and you are incorporating these therapeutic positions and activities. So how do we do that, right? So we want to model. We want to, um, maybe I start the session and I have all this therapy equipment, right? I have like maybe three different pieces of equipment or games sort of already set up. And maybe this session, um, you know, I have them in one possession position and we're playing one game and then we switch over and we do another position and another game. And then the child kind of starts to take over and I let them take over, right? I It moves sort of seamlessly into child directed play. And maybe the child will bring up positions and games that we had done a few sessions before, right? And so they'll go back to these games that they found so much fun, not realizing that they were in a tall meal or they were, you know, prone or or on this swing, which is a, you know, even just being on the swing is therapeutic for them. So sometimes we're modeling in the beginning of the sessions and we're creating these uh this environment that's a safe, playful environment. It's structured. And then the child feels safe and it feels like they can explore. And then the child really then takes over the session and it moves into that more child directed and, and playful. Um, you know, then we're really over here in that playfulness. Um, I loved this quote by Scard and Bundy um, in their play chapter in the book. And it says, to promote play, environments must enable children to move from what does this do, exploration, to what can I do with this, play, right? And thinking about that, um, we have to have that just right challenge. Um, and I think this is what's so hard for students because I'll say, make sure you have three backup activities for every activity because if you gauge the activity too hard, you're gonna see behaviors because they can't do it. And if you gauge the activity too easy, then they're not gonna wanna do it and they're bored. And this is what takes that art and skill. And this is why you know seasoned clinicians, they make it look so just easy. They make it look easy because they can engage what the child can do. And so that's how you get that just right challenge, which is so much harder for, for new therapists to do. But that's what makes it great, right? If the challenge is hard enough, then you're motivated that you want to do it. I am going to get that beanbag in that hole because this is so much fun and my therapist is going to jump up and down and, and I'm going to win, and right? And so getting that just right challenge is a huge part of the play. So hopefully now you're going to be thinking about play. You're going to be thinking Thinking about positioning. And there's a few things about positioning that's important for us to think about, right? So the sort of rules of positioning are is that it's gotta, it's gotta be comfortable, right? And there's gotta be sort of a stable base for that child in order to promote promote function. And then we need to make sure that the child is able to really engage and play in the environment while they're being positioned. So keeping those uh, sort of thoughts in mind. Um, when we're working with children with neurological disorders, we that that alignment piece is so important, right? We we would never want to like uh, stand a child if they weren't in proper alignment. So sometimes, depending on the child that we work with, we really have to take a minute, right, and make sure that that alignment and the symmetry is there um, before we move on. Um, and we also have to think about the fact that for some children, we really need to change those positions often, right? We don't want the child to fatigue because then that's work. <laughs> and um, for older children or bigger children, we want to make sure that, you know, they're not 20, 15, 20 minutes when we're in a session, we, we don't want to keep them more in that position. And when we're talking to parents, we really want to say no more than a half an hour to keep a child in any one position. We want to make sure that the positions are changing often. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move through some positions developmentally, sort of in that order to think about what I could put the child in a position or what might be appropriate or things I could work on. Um, and we're just going to run through it. Okay, so 
you know, at two months, this is not a play position for kids to be prone. It's just not, they can barely lift their head, right? This is a therapeutic position. And this is what we want parents to do um, with their kids. We want them to put them in prone. We want to give them that tummy time. We want to make sure that's happening. And, you know, this is therapeutic for them, right? It's not so much play, but we want to make sure that it's happening. Side-lying, you can get some engagement with a young child, right? Um, and when we have the child in side-lying, it's really facilitating bringing the hands together, which we always then also want the hands in the mouth. And so side-lying, we can, we can do some play um, when we're in side-lying with very young children. Around three months is when we can start to play with kids on their belly. Their hands are starting to open, right? That grasping reflex reflex is happening. And so now at three months, this is a play position. If you look at that nice back, right? And so how can we now play with parents? We can have the parents um, engaging with the child in different ways and prone. And this is just one of the ones I like, right? So TV is huge in the United States. Uh, parents are both working couples, they come home and they're watching TV, right? Not that I'm encouraging TV watching, I'm absolutely not, but you can position the child over the parent's legs with a mirror and some toys while the, the adult is getting a little bit of like downtime with the TV and the child's not able to see the TV in this position. So I think we have to work with parents and work with what their life schedule is. And we wanna encourage as much um, togetherness time as possible knowing that the reality is, is in the United States, at least both parents are working and they're tired when they get home. Okay. Um, one of the things I recommend a lot is using like a pillow to help prop kids up and it'll help them maintain that prone position a little bit longer. Um, we call them boppy pillows here, but you just roll up a towel. And for kids who really have a hard time with that prone position, it will help them main, oops, maintain it longer. Um, I love this picture. It's um, my two cousins and their two kids and they don't get to see each other that often. And so the older kids are all about the baby and right up in the baby's face. And so if the baby is supine and sort of laying there, it can be really overwhelming to have over, older children just sort of hovering over you. But if you prop a baby up prone, it really allows a much better interaction with the toddlers and the baby and sort of gives that baby a little bit of uh, space that they need need for play. So I highly recommend putting the babies in these propped positions when they're going to have um, older siblings or toddlers trying to play with them. This slide here is from Mary and she's showing, showing some um, older kids playing in prone. And one of the things that I love about this, if you look at the child on the bottom left, um, a lot of the kids that I work with have reflux, especially the younger kids under two, right? So they, they need tummy time, but they um, are spitting up a lot. So you can put them on a, on a pillow or a wedge or have the parent lay back and have that tummy time on them. And they're not so flat, right? Because if you have that sort of 45 degree angle, it helps with that spit up factor and trying to um, not spit up so much for the kids with reflux. For the kids who are in wheelchairs all day, um, putting them in that prone position really helps with those hip flexors muscles that get so tight. You know, they're in, wheel, especially if, you know, they're in a wheelchair all day, they come home. Those muscles are so, 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 so tight. So can we, you know, can we put them prone for a little while um, to really help uh, relax those muscles? Here, here's another picture of supine. Um, and I like this because again, if you look at the picture of the male with the baby, not to promote TV time, but he could be watching the TV, the baby can't see the TV and he can still interact or maybe catch the news at the same time, right? I try to give like real life examples, um, but you wanna have your face and the parent's face as close to the baby as possible because they don't have great vision before a year. And you wanna make all those babbling sounds like, you know, ma, 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 ba, 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 da, 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 like all those MBD beginning sounds, because we just want to constantly encourage that babbling the first year. I do like to do a lot of baby yoga where I'm like doing the hand um, to the opposite leg and things like that. Um, but again, this is just another position depending on the age of the child. 
here's a couple pictures of side lying. We talked about it for the infant, but for the older child, it can be a really nice timeout. Um, if you're working in the classroom, sometimes you'll see a kid is just losing it and you can't make it to nap time, right? And so the picture um, on the right you see here is like the adult is sort of giving a cocoon ish to the child, like, okay, you know, let's take that minute, right? And so giving that support, help regulating that child. Sometimes kids, that self-regulation, they can't do it on their own. Is the child autistic? Is the child just having a meltdown, right? We're helping them regulate in that sort of cocoon sideline position where they can still see the whole rest of the classroom. They can see everything that's going on, but we're sort of helping them. And then you can also just, you know, you have your little therapy session and you've, you you're working with a kid with um, cerebral palsy and you have wiped them out. They're really tired. You put them in the sideline, you go over, you change the equipment, change the swings, give them a second, and then you can get them back up and ready to go. There's lots of uses um, for these um, sideline. Here's another slide from Mary showing a homemade um, sideline board. How wonderful is that? These things are super expensive in the un United States. These tumble form side liars are very expensive. Um, and you can see here that they can also be made. Um, I love this little picture of a child at six months um, ring sitting. Because at six months, this child is supposed to be able to sit without support. And so we know with our kids with more severe disabilities, this happens much later. But we want to keep in mind that once they're able to sit, they don't necessarily have that side protection extension to the sides or backwards. So we always want to just make sure that we have um, pillows all the way around the child until we're positive that they have that protection extension to the side and backwards, um, especially when we're working um, with littler ones because when we walk up and they see us come they tend to put their hands up and then it'll uh it can they can fall right back um so just keeping in mind that that we need to check and make sure that they have that pr protective extension i do a lot in quadruped regardless of the age of the child. Quadruped might be one of my most commonly used positions. I just find it so versatile. You can do so many things, whether it's puzzles, um, dry erase boards on the floor, um, playing with cars or trains. I just always try to get the kids in a quadruped. Um, it's a really easy, um, for some, uh, for most, uh, position. Another one that comes in around eight months is the long sit position. And this is really difficult. I challenge you all to sort of read your book or next time you're watching TV, try to hold a long sit. I know I cannot, my hamstrings are way too tight for that. Um, but this is a therapeutic position. So think about that when you are trying to switch things up, like kids, you gotta do something different every time, right? So switch it up and try them in long sit. Um, pull to stand. I'm working right now with the child on pull to stand. They're about four months delayed. Um, and so we're trying to do really neat, fun things working on um, pull to stand. And then lowering, right? So pull to stand comes in first and then lowering comes in afterwards. So it's so funny because they get so frustrated for that two to three weeks that they're able to pull to stand, but they can't get back down. <laughs> right. So we want to help them um, learn how to do that as well. Pushing things, what, oh my goodness, what child doesn't love to push a grocery car or any kind of toy that's my son in the middle there? We watched him push this car around one vacation for like a week. It was like, who's going to watch him push? It was sort of like playing cards and whose turn was it to watch the baby? If you lost, you had to watch the baby. So it was motivation to win at cards. Um, side sitting is, again, one of my top choices, when you're working on side sitting, it really helps facilitate crossing midline, which is so needed, right? So always consider um, side sitting and it also gets weight bearing in on one side and you can switch it up. So keep that in your repertoire. Tall meal, I feel like the kids today have um, decreased trunk strength a lot. And so tall kneeling really works on that trunk strength. So can you be doing a fun game or dry erase board or chalkboard and you're in a tall kneel instead of standing because you're still getting all that scapula stability work, but you're also working on the trunk at the same time if you can sort of put those two together. Here's an awesome picture of Mary doing side sitting with her little cutie patootie. Love that. Um, and then if we're doing supine with our kids, because remember, with our more severe kids, we're switching it up, right? Every 20 to 30 minutes, we're changing those positions. Um, 
you know, make sure that they have something to engage with, some type of toy, music, something. They're not just laying there without any type of stimulation. Corner chairs are another good position. And I put the link in there. We had a cardboard carpentry echo meeting a while back that teaches you how to make these. Um, and so there's the link for there because those chairs can be expensive, but you can also make them. Um, here are some different um, options for standing. Mary, again, provided us this great slide that has a homemade stander in it. You know, these standing equipments can be really expensive. In the United States, sometimes um, you can get like the, the loaners because kids grow out of these and the parents don't want to hold on to them, right? Like these, this is big equipment. People don't want these in their house once they grow out of them. So is there some type of uh, lending library for these standards? Um, uh, standards in your... In in your area. So definitely um, check that out. But standing. Uh, bolster play. I use a lot. I love bolster play. You can do so much with the bolsters, especially with the quadruped. It helps kids hold that quadruped position much longer. Um, for kids where alignment is an issue, it really will help me. I'll have the parents sort of help me align the hands or the feet, um, depending what I'm doing with the bolster, because Sometimes for children, uh, maybe they have choreoaphytoid CP and that alignment is just critical and I need a second set of hands. Sometimes it's really nice to, to use a bolster or a ball to help support and then I can have the parents help with alignment when I'm trying to do weight bearing. I also really like bolsters for that hip adduction that you get. A lot of times children with CP, they have those tight adductors. And so we want to sort of relax those muscles and have them have that nice hip adduction. And so here's some, you know, that, that bolster swing that you see, or these little scooters, or you, the great picture in the top, right? The kid is just sitting on the bolster playing, but it's allowing, again, those children that are uh, maybe in wheelchairs all day or just have tight adductors. It's a really nice, gentle stretch. And you can see some, some more toys, again, that um, will provide that stretch. And can you can you involve another child? Like, are you in a preschool setting or a school setting where you can take two children and have them work together so that it's not always just you playing with this other child? It's actually a peer, which would be ideal if you can. Not always, especially outpatient, you can't really do that. Um, here are some different swings that also work on that. Um, the middle one, the moon swing, I have my students at, uh, where I am do both the, the sort of the pummel swing on the far right. And then I have them do the moon swing to sort of see the difference of grading, right? So um, the pummel swing is much easier. And then to go to the moon swing, that is grading up for sure, right? I'm like, oh, no, you can't put a kid on a swing unless you've been on a swing, right? So making sure that you see that difference of like how much work it takes between um, those different swings, but also how much fun, like sometimes they don't even realize the workout they're getting because it's so much fun. So um, again, grading that challenge of the just right challenge. I have this enormous, huge orange, I call it the baby ball, because I'm like this this ball is only for babies. Like you cannot put an adult or a child on this ball. It's like one of those really big ones. But it allows for the, the baby to be prone in the whole surface on the ball, which is so wonderful. But we can use balls um, depending on the size for half meal, right? Working with kids, half meal, and then and also weight bearing um, through their uh, forearms. So how can you just keep changing up the positions? Because kids get bored. So you've got to have different positions and different games every time they come in. Then when it's child-directed play, they might bring back something that you had or switch it up a little bit. Maybe you were on this swing and now they want to throw scars, but you did tennis balls before. So maybe they're changing it a little bit, but you're sort of giving them um, some ideas. Uh, again, it's prone over the ball. Again, that can really help with hip flexors, making sure that we're giving a little stretch to them. Peanuts are the balls that have like the dip in the middle. So they're much more stable than a regular therapy ball. They can be really nice for doing some sit to stand or some dynamic reaching. And here, here's just all these different tools, right? So 
we can have all kinds of equipment. Like this is a therapeutic scooter board, but you can also buy the $10 scooter boards, right? Where you have the child prone. And um, I'm in a preschool classroom right now and I was pulling them around with a hula hoop the other day. And, and it was just, they had so much fun. Like they have no idea that they're actually getting a workout, right? Um, when they're being pulled around and being, you know, circling around on this scooter board, they just think it's so much fun. And then you know, I'm a, sort of a smaller person. So then I'm sitting on the scooter board and I'm having the preschoolers push me all around uh, the preschool classroom. Um, and so just making, making it fun, right? Um, and when you look at all this, you could build a ramp, you could build a boat, like we could, we could build all kinds of things that they have to climb over or under or up, right? So just trying to create that playful environment, but also keeping in mind how you want them to be positioned and hopefully allow them to take over that session, make it child-directed play, um, and you're you're doing great. Okay, here's some resource links and my references. And now Mary is going to take over, and this is her case study, and take it away, Mary. Oh, I forgot to ask. Did anyone have any questions? I didn't even give you a chance. I was like, oh, 1.30. I got to be done. Did anyone have any questions for me? No? Okay. Take it. I'll look and I'll monitor the chat if any come in while you're talking. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope I'm audible. Um, Ali is a six six and a half year old boy with mild spastic cerebral palsy. He he has recently visited the clinic, uh, the OT clinic for the first time. He presented with poor body alignment, poor head and trunk control, drooling, weak grip, especially on the right hand, moves around through crawling, but the, uh, for a short period of time, he loves playing and exploring with both his legs and hands. For the OT's observation, the child is very interactive and is motivated to participate in play activities. Currently, the OT is working uh, to improve his transitional movements from lying down to sitting and from sitting to crawling position, uh, reducing uh, the other uh, thing that the OT is working on is reducing drooling and improving on hand function. So for our questions, um, uh, question one, for the therapist directed play, what are some play activities which cor with corresponding positions Ali could participate in, in for therapeutic engagement? Question two, if Ali wanted to play catch, what are some positions or equipment he could be placed in or on for a fun game of catch. Uh, question three, what are some positions or equipment Ali could, could utilize to facilitate hip abduction, stretch and or a stretch to his hip flexors? Question four, what is a position you learned today that you would like to try moving forward? All right, so all your facilitators have the case study ready as well as the questions. And so I'm gonna go ahead and open up the breakout rooms now. All right, welcome back everyone. I hope you all had good discussions within your groups. Um, we'll go ahead and start opening it up to everyone. Uh, for the first question, Maggie, what was your group's response? Um, so for the um, some play activities with some positions, we were thinking about doing, you know, sideline or other sort of like weight bearing activities, maybe doing cards or cards down a slide board or different kind of um, games and other ways that incorporate a whole bunch of different positioning. Thank you so much. And then Kelsey, did your guys' group have anything different? Yeah, so we talked about um, getting the child in prone, which would help with that head control. 
we talked about um it would be a grade up it'd be a little tough but they could still do it if they're um on like a high enough wedge to incorporate activities that might include like blowing bubbles or blowing with a straw to work on that lip um, closure and then having that pressure on the abdomen too for um, proprioceptive feedback. We also talked about high kneeling um, where they can weight bear on the table and that might be somewhere that you can get a really child led um, activity because it's a more difficult position but having something more motivating might keep them, keep them there. That's great. Our group also did a similar thing, um, such as like blowing bubbles. And then we talked about going into quadruped and transferring items from left to right, crossing midline, um, and then just also kind of tracking activities between um, going from supine to sideline and then moving to sitting. So we'll move on to the second question. Um, Lindsay, what did your group say? Yeah, so for the second question with the, um, the ball play, um, some suggested using a corner chair um, to really give a lot of stability um, to kind of promote the use of the hands, um, to kind of play with the ball, throw it, catch it, um, and work on grasping it with that right hand. And then also um, thought about like grading it in a way. Um, you could be like in prone on a wedge and start with like rolling the ball back and forth um, as like a good warm up too. Thank you. And Adonis? Uh, we suggest sitting position on an adapted chair or sitting on a bench and uh, working uh, with balloons or uh, bin bags or softer balls before progressing to smaller tennis uh, size balls. Thank you. And then Maggie, did your group have anything different for this one? Um, we had, you know, some kneeling um, with support on, you know, kind of the other opposite sides. Um, also using um, kind of like large um, balls as well or doing other sort of like seated activities with kind of support and positioning um, around. Thank you so much. Okay. And then the third question, which was looking at facilitating a hip abduction stretch um, or a stretch for the hip flexors. Kelsey, what kind of positions or equipment did your group think of? Um, so we talked for um, hip adduction. We talked about getting them on a bolster or a peanut bowl, using abductor pillows. If they don't have any of that, um, you can also use like towel and blanket rolls. Um, and you can size up and down in order to find the best stretch. Um, for hip flexors, we talked about um, being prone over a ball. Right. Similar, we also had um, sitting on a roller, placing a pillow or a wedge um, between the thighs while they're in sideline, using a peanut ball and having them sit over the peanut ball or also um, a long sitting stretch. All right. And then moving on to the last question, which is what is a position you learned today that you would like to try moving forward? Lindsay, what did your group say? Yeah, so some um, mentioned... Um, that it was just a good reminder to talk more about sideline, um, especially like in early intervention with that population, birth to three, um, with like the littles using sideline a bit more. So um, one stated that that was a goal. Um, and then another um, said that they would like to use quad quadruped um, a little bit more moving forward. Thank you. And Adonis? Well, uh, the prone position for the three months old children. That was a, a popular one with tenure group. Okay. Yeah. That's great. And then Maggie, did you guys have any positions in your group? Yeah, we had, um, we talked about doing tummy time with the parent um, and really kind of incorporating the parent in the session to kind of involve that, you know, education, but also building it into a routine and kind of doing problem solving with the parent there. Um, also with the long sitting, um, like Kate was saying today, how, you know, even for us to be able to be in that position, it can be really challenging. So kind of incorporating things like that. And then also the quadruped to kind of get that, you know, pretty much full body um, weight bearing, trunk control, head control, neck control, and things like that. Um, but overall, just having a really great reminder to kind of switch up positioning 
and incorporate other things in our in our sessions. Thank you, Maggie and Kelsey. I'm muted. Um, we talked about um, that sideline position, especially with the parent. Um, with that like social feedback plus like if they're cocooned a little bit too it help with um proprioceptive um we also talked that uh people would like to incorporate both high kneeling and prone um into their sessions and then i also brought up that i am constantly trying to remember um to get my child inside sitting because it does really help with the transitions in and out of positions as well that's great uh yeah in my group we discussed um sideline and using long long kneeling because um one of the individuals said that they're used to using prone but sideline might be more comfortable and engaging for the child as well as just kind of in long kneeling focusing on engaging those trunk muscles and then another member of our group talked about quadruped and long sitting to relax the hip flexor muscles but that is all of those questions i appreciate everyone participating um, next week is our last session and I will be presenting on different play strategies and sensory regulation strategies for children with an autism diagnosis. And so I hope you all can please attend um, and continue to respond to the survey links. But again, thank you all for your time. Thank you, Kate, for presenting and thank you, Mary, for your case study.